Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 252, The Japanese Are Coming, Thailand Falls. On November 26, 1941, as talks between Tokyo and Washington seemed to be going in circles, because neither side would concede anything of consequence, the fleet of Admiral Nagumo, the commander-in-chief of the 1st Air Fleet, the commander of the Kitobu Tai, the carrier group that would strike at Pearl Harbor, put to sea. However, as several within the highest circle in Japan were still hesitant to go to war with the United States, the message to put to sea was joined with this. In case negotiations with the U.S. reach a successful conclusion, the task force will immediately put about and return. Those weary of war did not want Another foolhardy, headlong attack, like the ones that had caused a war to start in Manchuria and then later in southern China. The final line with the West had not yet been crossed. On that same day, November 26th, U.S. intelligence reports told of Japanese troop transport ships south of Formosa, modern-day Taiwan. For FDR, this was clearly a sign of bad faith on the part of the Japanese. After all, talks were still, at least technically, ongoing. So, he had Secretary of State Cordell Hull reject Japan's latest empty offer of peace and resumed trade. The U.S. insisted on an open-door policy for China, namely that the Japanese would remove all military personnel from there and Indochina. For newly made Prime Minister Tojo, this left no glimmer of hope for peace. He told the Japanese embassies around the world to be ready to destroy their codes and machines. The next day, November 27th, the U.S. military told the president that they could handle the Japanese in the Pacific, just not yet. More time was needed. For example, more men and equipment were being sent to the Philippines. But FDR could only say that he would do his best. To his thinking, the Japanese had already made up their minds to go to war. The question was simply where and when. As touching the Philippines, General MacArthur was told, should hostilities occur, you will carry out the tasks assigned in revised Rainbow Five. Essentially, he was to use his built-up air power to bomb enemy formations and installations within tactical operating range. On November 28th, FDR and his cabinet were told that intelligence had confirmed that Japanese invasion forces were ready to sail from Shanghai, Formosa, and Hainan in southern China, less than 300 miles east of Hanoi, Indochina to land a terrific blow at the British in Singapore, the Netherlands in the Dutch East Indies, and the United States in the Philippines. The next day, MAGIC, the overall name given to the U.S.'s efforts to monitor, intercept, decode, and translate Japanese military and diplomatic messages, picked up the following from German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop. 
Should Japan become engaged in a war against the U.S., Germany, of course, would join the war immediately. On December 1st, the British Admiralty ordered the battlecruiser Repulse, along with the battleship Prince of Wales, one of the most modern of that kind, to turn from going to Singapore, but instead to head for Darwin, northern Australia, to disconcert the Japanese, and at the same time, to widen the area of projected power. The two vessels were the main sea power the British had in Southeast Asia at the time, and as Singapore was deemed able to defend itself, certainly from an attack from the sea, it was thought that being a bit unpredictable may throw the Japanese off, whatever game they were playing with their various transport ships taking on men and supplies. And by December 3rd, those 14 transport ships, with their escorts, were ready, and so left Hanan Island. Their crossing of the Gulf of Thailand was expected to, and needed to, last four days, for nothing could be allowed to give away the Empire's hand before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Vice Admiral Sir Tom Phillips, commander of the British Far Eastern Fleet, flew from Singapore to Manila to talk with General MacArthur and Admiral Hart, himself the commander of the American Asiatic Fleet, concerning American naval and air support in Britain's seemingly upcoming battle with Japan. The British did not have much in the way of a naval presence there, concerning the amount of water in Southeast Asia they had to protect. One heavy cruiser, one light cruiser, 13 World War I four-stack destroyers, and 29 submarines. But these vessels were as ready as they could be. Yet the Admiral's trip was cut short when, during the next day, a Royal Australian Air Force Hudson, a U.S.-made light bomber and coastal reconnaissance aircraft, which had lifted off from northeast Malaya, had spotted a large Japanese invasion convoy heading west across the Gulf of Thailand. Unidentified aircraft, but assumed to be the Japanese, had also been spotted over or near Clark Field in the Philippines. Just after this report, the Hudson was shot down by Japanese air patrols. Phillips said he had to leave to be there when the war started. As for the mystery planes over Clark Field, MacArthur was unworried. As he told the British Admiral before he left, by April of 1942, the U.S. would have 200,000 trained men, 256 bombers, and 195 fighters on Luzon. But at the moment, MacArthur only had 130,000 men, of which 100,000 of them were poorly equipped and barely trained locals. As for his air presence, the largest the U.S. had in the area, MacArthur was currently weak here as well, with only 35 B-17s and 107 Curtis P-40 Warhawk fighters. Also, before the British Admiral left, he asked Admiral Hart if four American destroyers could join the battlecruiser Repulse and the battleship Prince of Wales, along with their escorts, in sailing up the coast from Singapore. It was hoped this would deter the Japanese from anything rash. The American admiral agreed. Before December 3rd was out, Churchill, in talking to his chiefs of staff, had to admit that it was now impossible to tell exactly where the Japanese were going to land. Either way, wherever that was, they would probably be outnumbering any Commonwealth defensive forces awaiting them, as the aggressor would be selecting the point of attack. The best that could be done was to put the entire Far East Command on war alert. But as that conversation was going on, General Percival, General Officer Commanding Malaya Command, and his staff were having their own talks with Air Marshal Brooke Popham. The question before them, given the warnings that were now pouring in, was, should Operation Matador be activated? 
If so, then the 11th Indian Division, currently in northern Malaya, would push further north, crossing into southern Thailand, and hold the Thai port cities of Singora and Patani, where the Japanese were expected to land. Yet the British minister in Bangkok, by phone, told the air marshal that to do that would give the Japanese the excuse they needed to attack openly. Basically, that the preemptive move would put the Allies in the wrong. Percival was forced by Brooke Popham to compromise by having the Indian 11th move only closer to the border. Before the sun set, an RAF patrol had spotted the enemy convoy less than 100 miles from Singora. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity and... How far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. On December 6th, less than 24 hours before the air attack began on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese 48th Division, aboard 27 transports, left Formosa, modern-day Taiwan. Their destination was the Philippines to the south. The pilots watched the ships leave. They had already been told that their 400 aircraft of the Navy's 11th Air Fleet would soon raid Luzon and destroy all of the American B-17 bombers. As the sun made its first appearance over the rooftops of Europe on Sunday, December 7th, it was still dark in Washington. FDR was asleep and knew he needed his rest, for on his desk was a 30-page draft of a speech that he was readying to make to Congress. In it was a request his request, to declare war on the Japanese Empire if she attacked British or Dutch possessions in the Far East, even if the American-protected Philippines were left alone. It was risky, but the President knew there would be no more talks in good faith. He was simply trying to position himself for the inevitable. A little later, even closer to the moment when Pearl Harbor would see its first enemy plane overhead, General Homa and Admiral Takahashi at Formosa headquarters worried over their part of Operation No. 1, the invasion of the Philippines. For all their planning, training, and practice, it seemed that Mother Nature was about to play a cruel trick. Low clouds had come in, which meant the 11th Air Fleet's bombers could not take off to destroy the B-17s, nor support the invasion force. Worse, if the skies over Luzon were clear enough, once the shooting started, the Americans would be able to take off and bomb the transports, thus killing thousands of their men, and then they could continue on and bomb Formosa's military installations, were the gods really on their side. Weather, in the form of rough seas, also dominated the thoughts of General Yamashita, the commander of the Malayan invasion force. As he and his were coming ever closer to the Kra Peninsula that comprised southern Thailand and northern Malaya above Singapore, 
His ships had separated into two groups. One group would land at the ports in southern Thailand, Singora and Patani, as General Percival feared, while the other along the beaches of northern Malaya at Kota Baru. Yet one of Yamashita's more fanatical officers, Colonel Zinji, had the answer. So what if the waves are high and you get knocked off your boat? If you are wearing your life jacket, the waves will take you ashore. The invasion can still take place. Believe it or not, this did not settle the nerves of his men. But for the colonel, his main worry was the British fleet stationed in Singapore. Had he and his men come all this way just to be sunk before making landfall? True, it was the job of Admiral Ozawa's battle fleet to protect them, but Zinji would feel a lot better if the Navy's 99 bombers and 39 torpedo planes, currently based in nearby Indochina, would find and destroy the two British war vessels. Yes, hopefully the gods were looking out for them. Meanwhile, in Japan, the citizens of the land of the rising sun were sleeping, as December 7th gave way to the 8th. What they would wake up to, though, was their part of the world at war, complete and merciless war. As the Japanese military had planned it, taking advantage of the sun rising first in the east and then making its way west, as light came to Oahu, then Wake, then Guam, then Hong Kong, then to the Philippines, then to Malaya, but hopefully not Thailand in one regard, so would war. Hoping to avoid a war with the Kingdom of Thailand, the Japanese gave their Prime Minister one last chance to allow the Japanese military to enter his country without bloodshed at 11 p.m. local time on December 7th. As the Japanese transports and land forces in Indochina were about to invade, Bangkok had only two hours to respond. But Prime Minister Faibun would remain silent. At 5.45 a.m. Hawaiian time, the Japanese strike force, some 200 miles north of Oahu, launched its reconnaissance seaplanes to scour the target island to the south. Meanwhile, as it was 11.45 p.m. in Singapore, General Yamashita's most southern invasion force of the three approaching land arrived at the beach of Kota Baru in northern Malaya. With them were four destroyers and a light cruiser. The ships began a bombardment of the defenses in the form of pillboxes manned by the 9th Indian Army Division. Rain had added itself to the high seas. Still, the first of the 5,000 Japanese troops came ashore as best they could. The Indians opened fire. Fifteen minutes later, at midnight in Singapore, the RAF headquarters there got the report that the Japanese were landing at Kota Baru. Permission was being requested to launch the aircraft at Kota Baru Air Base further inland. The response, instead of a yes, was a strained, Go for the transports, you bloody fools! Soon after, Hudson Light Bombers began to take off in search of the Japanese. In truth, however, the Hudson raids were not as organized nor as efficient as they could have been. One transport was damaged, but that was it. The invasion went apace. Oddly, Sir Shenton Thomas, governor of the Straits Settlement, which included Malaya, Brunei, and British North Borneo, was not unduly worried. When General Percival phoned him with an update, Thomas said, Well, I suppose you'll shove the little men off. The governor also intended to have the local police arrest all the local Japanese, a preview of what the Americans would do on their west coast after Pearl Harbor. But the Japanese would not be forestalled at Kota Baru. With their naval cover, the troops kept coming ashore, and before too long, the 9th Indian Division was being pushed back. Just to the north, at 1.30 a.m. local time, but 7.30 a.m. Hawaiian time, 
General Yamashita and his 14 transports of troops landed at Singora Beach in southern Thailand, completely unopposed. The general then sent his fanatical colonel and his special unit to the Japanese consulate. Once the ambassador was awakened, they all went to the local Thai police headquarters with the idea of bribing the local officials to help them sneak in Japanese troops past the British lines and into northern Malaya. Yet, as Thai Prime Minister Faibun had not yet sent any word of any alliance with the Japanese, the local Thai police opened fire when the Japanese yelled out, Ally with us and attack the British army! The passionate, fanatic colonel's plans of sneaking across the border was a bust, yet Singora and Patani were still quickly taken by the invaders. By the time these two coastal areas were under Japanese control, the sun had started to rise. This brought further Japanese incursions into Thailand, this time from Indochina, invading the eastern central section of the country, the Phra Tabong province, which fell quickly. The Japanese 15th Army, coming in unopposed, made their way to the northwest, following the rail line, which allowed faster movement. Their ultimate goal was to make for and subdue Burma, while the 25th Army would turn south and take southern Thailand, if need be, then northern Malaya, and finally help with the fall of Singapore. Another amphibious landing took place at Chumphon, halfway down the Kra Peninsula, about 463 kilometers, or 288 miles south of the capital of Bangkok. The Japanese 1st Infantry Battalion of the 143rd Infantry Regiment of the 55th Division landed in two groups, one to split the defenders before them, and two to provide flanking coverage for each other. Yet this carefully worked out plan did not factor in the patriotic enthusiasm of the youth soldier cadets of a nearby training school, nor the tenacity of the regular Army 38th Infantry Battalion, which was supported by the local police, who knew the area well. The Japanese were kept at bay, which threw off their timetable. There were several additional landings by Japanese troops up and down the Kraw Peninsula. Some were opposed, others not at all. Yet Japanese leadership was still vexed by this. Thailand's airports, rail lines, and roads were needed to push onto Singapore, as well as to Burma in the northwest, as quickly as possible. Moreover, the Thais were needed as active allies in this war against the West. The question was, what would Prime Minister Faibun tell his 26,000 well-trained and equipped soldiers, not to mention his 24,000 reserve force, to do? Stand down or resist until the end? If it was the latter, then this may well signify the end of Japan's capturing of Singapore, because to approach it from the sea would play perfectly into British defensive plans. When it was 10 a.m. in Pearl Harbor, and the second attack wave was mostly done with its work, in Shanghai it was 4 a.m. December 8th, and there Lieutenant Commander Columbus Smith received a call at his apartment from his quartermaster telling him of the surprise attack at Pearl. Smith's standing order from Washington was to scuttle his ship should war come. The Japanese had held Shanghai since 1937, and their grip on the city and its port would not allow the Americans to stand up to the occupiers or fight their way out. Yet, as Operation No. 1 was carefully planned out by the Japanese, a locally commanding Japanese officer had asked Smith where he would be on December 8th. Why? Well, the local officer wanted to give Smith and the men of the USS Wake, his gunboat, a turkey as a sign of good faith. In reality, it was so they would know where the ship's commander was when Pearl was hit. 
Hence, Smith got the call and rushed to the harbor, but only to find that a large Japanese force already controlled his ship. Soon, the USS Wake would be handed over to the puppet Wang Jiwei regime in Nanjing that was collaborating with the occupiers. She would be renamed the Tatara. In time, the gunboat would come under the control of the Chinese communists, the victors of the country's civil war. The same fate almost befell the British gunboat, Petrel, but her captain actively resisted, that is, until the shelling started. Some sections of the Thai Defense Force was giving a good account of themselves. As the sun rose on December 8th, local time, most of the Thais were still heavily engaged, whether they were winning or not. Again, Lieutenant Generals Shijiro and Yamashita could not afford the delay as it allowed the Commonwealth forces in Malaya and Burma to ready themselves further. So, out of desperation, despite the previously, though limited, agreement that stated certain sections of Thailand were out of bounds, the two generals had one bomb dropped on the capital, Bangkok. It hit the main post office of the city, but did not detonate. Still, upon hearing of this, the Thai cabinet was most anxious to hear the decision of Phi Boom. Finally, after midday, the Prime Minister came out of wherever he was, no one had known, and they all agreed to give in to the Japanese. Soldiers of the Japanese 15th Army then moved into Bangkok and set up a command post in the Chamber of Commerce building. The various fighting Thai units would get word from their government at different times, but as they did, they all laid down their arms. Further, Thailand would be used as a base of operations to help in the attacks on Malaya and Burma, as Tokyo had wished. Indeed, Japanese air squadrons from Indochina arrived soon after the ceasefire, refueled, and then began bombing northern Malaya and Singapore. Just days later, on December 14th, Prime Minister Phi Boon signed a non-disclosed agreement that said Thai troops would help fight in Malaya and Burma. The official public alliance, however, was formally signed on December 21st. But not until January 25th, 1942, did the Thai government declare war on the United States and Great Britain. The Thai ambassador in London did his duty and handed over the declaration of war. However, the ambassador to the United States, Seni Pramaj, instead would organize the Free Tide Movement, initializing the Thai Underground Resistance Movement. This would force the occupiers to keep substantial troops in-country, thus weakening other theaters of war. <laughs> ¶¶